Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, No More Boring Safety Trainings, sponsored by Turning Technologies, and including our speaker today from DECRA. My name is Barry Botino, and I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine. I'll be your moderator today. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. The views of today's speaker and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean that the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session with our speaker. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time at all during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can today, but we might not be able to get to everyone's questions. Any questions we don't get to, however, will be forwarded along to today's speaker. Among the resources available today for all our attendees is the complete slide presentation from this webcast. And you can find that by checking out the resources widget which is located on the left-hand side of your screen. If you happen to have any technical issues during this webcast, please refer to our list of helpful tips located on the right-hand portion of your screen. And for basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button, which is located at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you more about that later. This webcast will be archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Joe Melton, the Director of Consulting Services at DECRA. Joe has practiced in safety-related fields for 12 years, and for 10 years, he specialized his focus on regulatory compliance, behavioral safety, safety culture, safety management systems analysis, leadership development, and auditing safety systems. Joe's presentation today is very timely, considering that a number of our attendees, including our entire team here at the National Safety Council, are now working remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and folks are definitely looking to stay current on their training during this time. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation. Joe, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Barry. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us this afternoon or morning, depending on uh, what part of the country you're in. Uh, so let's just go ahead and get into it. <clears throat> the uh, the agenda, what we want to make of our uh, our hour, we're going to go over some uh, some tools and techniques that I've picked up on. Um, nothing we're going to go over is real uh, rocket surgery here, uh, but there's a few different uh, uh, things you can imp implement into your uh, your trainings, your meetings, um, monthly safety games, just overall getting that, that employee engagement. Um, we we want to go over what's your teaching styles, knowing your audience, um, and the overall, uh, we're, we're, there's some that if it's a five minute training or a four hour training, there's different tips that we want all of you to be able to take away. So some of the things that I, I'm not necessarily going to spend a lot of time on is the topic of well, how do we engage uh, millennials? We're going to look at how do we engage people? How do we engage the uh, the your employees, whoever it is that you're training, if it's a, a group of high school kids, um, if it's a college age, all ages, whatever it is, we're going to look to engage those folks uh, to get the, the retention of the information you're trying to deliver. Uh, basic setups of a room, audio equipment, PowerPoint, setting up a computer, call IT in your company. They'll, they'll help you with those things. I really want to focus on the, uh, the, the specific tools and tips and little tricks of the trade that have been helpful. So you're getting the under the hood look from a consultant that has conducted uh, thousands of trainings um, with over tens of thousands of individuals and things that I, that I have found that keeps people away from doing the cell phone prayer. And what I mean by the, the cell phone prayer is you'll be doing a class and the person will put the phone underneath the, the table or on their lap and they'll be looking down and uh, they're playing Candy Crush or they're looking at their fancy football 
um, or did. Hopefully we have football this fall. Um, but those, those types of things, how do we avoid that disconnect and re-engaging their eyes back in, onto the screen? Uh, and, and even now we're, we're challenged with the uh, not bringing groups together more than five or six people. A lot of people in organizations and companies right now are being challenged by conducting their, their necessary trainings, but delivering in a way that is um, a non-traditional form through Zoom, go to WebEx, um, doing remote trainings that they haven't done before, not bringing a whole shift into a room at a time or whatever it was, that we're, we're doing micro trainings. How do we keep that, uh, that retention and get that, that content that we want to that person? So let's uh, go ahead and go over a couple of those. So here I've highlighted uh, something that I like to do is uh you know kind of an icebreaker get people going i'm a bit i played football in college so um, a lot of the times i'll lead by talking about safety culture going back to the visible cultures that we have in sports and uh in other areas as well so just simply break the ice who's their favorite team and um you know using the turning technology uh the clickers either through the handheld clickers in their hand or using the uh, cell phone ability, they're instantly able to see how they answer. And at this point in time, what they don't know is I put them on a team. So what I like to do when I teach my 10 and 30 hour general industry OSHA classes, I'll put them on a team and they don't know it. And at this point in time, I would say, all right, all you Hawkeyes out there, um, and I should have warned, I'm from Iowa and I, I love the, the Hawkeyes, so that's the one I'm gonna pull for. So all my hot guys out there, all these required questions, um, you want to make sure you're all answering them correctly because at the end, there's going to be a winner and so on and so forth. And uh, that's one way to get them engaged. When you ask a critical question, you know, you're going over lockout tagout, you're going over emergency action plan, you're doing the, um, you know, your WPS training, whatever it is that you're doing, you're able to engage them by, by hooking them like, okay, the winner gets the go through the chow line first, or the winning team gets to pick out a hat, or, you know, you, you find something nominal that, that's worth paying attention for. And I'll tell you, from my experience, when you pull up a clicker question and they know they're on a team and they're competing, your those competitive edges are coming out. Like those clickers are flying around the table. They're like, all right, let's get ready. Even your roughnecks, you know, your, your cave people, I call them, those citizens against virtually everything. They're sitting there, you know, they're telling all the other, hey, where, where's my gophers at? Let's all pay attention here. And you know, you really see just the tone of the room change. And it's something as simple as asking a, uh, a question when they get an instant response on the screen. And that's what, how I really like to use it. It gets their engagement and a tip for you here, for those that are the note takers, every three to five slides, Okay, so as you're building out your slide deck, try to have something that engages their brain back to your screen in three to five slides. Either pictures, clicker questions, videos, a workshop. You know, so uh, one of the aspects that I like to cover is let people know who I am. Many times when I go into an organization, they haven't met me before. You know, so if I'm doing an observer training or a coach's training, or you know a leadership training whatever it is they brought us in for um i gotta let them know my background where am i from I, i'm from iowa i'm one of eight kids my safety was on the farm you know very farm operations food uh background you know i played football in college there you see a picture with the iowa uh, hot guy football coach kirk ferentz i am a high school football coach that was at our high school convention um so those are you know uh, you know, see the aspects of having three girls, um, you know, and those, those things you learn as a parent. And so sometimes as the presenter, and not just a presenter, an educator, they, when you're trying to it, not just deliver the standards, like anyone can get up and read 1910 general industry, lockout, tag out, or 272 grain standard, you know, 146, 147, but can you get it relatable to them? Can you put it in a way, hey, from my experience on the farm, machine guarding is pretty doggone important because I remember when my grandpa lost a few fingers to uh, a PTO shaft. You know, so finding that 
And that goes back to knowing your audience, okay? Now, if you don't have those experiences, um, go back to the old Seinfeld model, the Peterman. Don't be afraid to do a Peterman. Tell, tell someone else's story, not necessarily as your own, but resource and use those experiences. But they know where you're coming from when they know who you are. So don't be afraid um, to put a little bit in there uh, of who you are and where you're coming from, especially if it's in front of a group of new hires or you're going to another site that's not your primary site. Um, those things can, that can be useful. Uh, as you're building out your training, go back just like you were, did in 10th grade English class and you're building out your outline. What's your purpose? Okay. So the purpose of our trainings is we want to educate. Um, we want employees to identify risk. And we want them to, to have the empowerment to manage that risk. Uh, there's regulatory demands, locked out, tag out, powered equipment, forklifts, those such things. Those that have regular frequency requirements, um, ultimately to reduce employees' risk exposure and increase hazard recognition to where you have a higher performing, caring employee, you're gonna be better at everything you're trying to do. When your employees are operating at that level, your quality, things that you're trying to do are gonna fall into place, your customer service is gonna fall into place, production and efficiency, and ultimately that care and want to is gonna be affected. So uh, when you're building that training, find that purpose and, and continue to drive back to it as you're building it out. So some pitfalls uh, of overtraining is we use it as a punishment technique. Uh, when somebody breaks a policy, uh, whatever it is, they're not wearing the seatbelt on the forklift, um, they improperly tied off with fall protection, uh, whatever it is, our immediate is, is, oh, they must have had a knowledge gap, we're going to retrain them. So sometimes uh, that it is necessary. There is a knowledge gap. We do need to re-educate them. We do need to put them back through it. But I would just heed the caution that that is our immediate root cause is, you know, we do the investigation. Oh, the employee was stupid. We're going to retrain them. Okay. Go beyond the, the trap of overtraining. And that will help keep the integrity of your training as well. So people aren't like, oh, my gosh, I got to go through another safety training. This thing is really going to be a doozer. Um, and that goes into being a, a teacher, not a preacher. And this is my high school football coach is going to come out. Um, I kind of like to use the old uh, Eisenhower 101 technique. You know, I can tell a bunch of kids what to do. But, man, we're going to be far more successful when they're doing it because they want to do it. When they're holding their position and technique and they're doing their job because they want to do it, because they want to be a part of the team, they want it to all work together you're able to get that group of individuals to that point when you're teaching and not just preaching at them. So as many times I'll say, do safety with people, not at them. Um, so that's kind of another tip as you're doing the training. Um, what I'll do when I'm conducting the, the front of the class, I'll look for those people that are super engaged and I'll, you know, say, Hey, Steven, um, you know, from your experience, you've been a 12 year old. What do you think? And then maybe, you know, not just to only pick on the people in the back row that are trying to stay awake, from, uh, awake and, and whatnot, tie in those people who are engaged and see how the others react to it. So as you're conducting, um, don't just sit behind and read the slides every word. Kind of manage and, and read the, the, the body language of your group. Um, and know the difference between when we need to train and when we need to educate. Um, you know, there's a classroom portion that's important, but don't forget the importance of that hands-on. You know, when we conduct coaching and uh, observer training, that, hand, that classroom piece is important, but we spend just as much time out there on the floor. Okay, let's go up and have a conversation with your coworker here. Uh, I, got, I got to do what? Uh, where's my form? No, let's go talk to somebody. Uh, and that hands-on piece, just like lockout, tagout, it's easy enough to be able to go through the steps, but can they actually go on the floor and perform it? And those, that's that, that two-piece as you're going through. Get that hands-on. Do the workshop. Um, do the videos. Do the pictures. And those things will help keep them engaged. So when I build out any class that I'm doing, I explain the why. Why are you here? Um, you know, I love to use uh, uh, recent pictures that I find, uh, recent stories, whatever it is. Within, specifically within safety culture, 
Uh, if you know, if I'm in a part of the the country, Montana or Washington, I'll look for recent events and say, hey, the, the reason you're here and I need you to pay attention is look at this incident that just occurred. You know, look at these. Well, how did this impact this community? How did it impact their family? How did it impact the organization? How did it impact those individuals? That's why you're here. Then give the what and then show the how. Um, those are the three parts of the building that I've seen uh, be pretty successful, and it keeps them engaged throughout the training. Another piece we don't want, want to fall from is find the motivation. You know, here I got a couple of walleyes. I got one mounted here. I'm looking at it here in my office. It's a gorgeous 29-inch walleye from South Dakota. Uh, when I was up there uh, uh, fishing a couple years ago with some buddies, you know, that's what would motivate me. So as you go through your training and your education and you're trying to get that seat to the next level, what motivates them? What will, are they potentially putting at risk? And more specifically, what I'll do is who's in your waiting room? If you allow a coworker to, to make a, an error, a mistake, to put you and others at risk, who's going to be in their waiting room? And would you want to be able to have that conversation with their loved ones that you should have or could have done something to prevent and you didn't, or if it's yourself, why would you put others to, to, to exposure of that risk? What would motivate them? And when you're in that, missing the fishing, missing the boat rides, missing the, the riding the motorcycle and the kids practices and those things, that's when you find that deeper motivational level. So find that in all your trainings what would motivate them and using relative visuals okay so this is a grain bend i live in iowa um this is something that has uh, really peaked up this fall into the winter we had a uh, increase in grain entrapments and engulfments uh so if i were conducting a training in the midwest and small rural communities so this would be relatable if i were doing a training in florida in orlando I maybe would have more alligators and Disney and those things, okay? So know your audience, know where you're at, use relative. Don't just go and pull a PowerPoint off the internet from OSHA's website or your insurance provider, plug it in and do slide reading. Um, you know, slide readers, uh, you're, they're gonna disengage and you're as good as your sign-in sheet. <clears throat> Another free tool that's out there um data give people slides show them that hey this is the uh uh federal motor carrier uh website this is the uh federal this is the uh, national united states fatalities on the roadway we're floating about thirty-eight thousand people die a year on the road so it's not just when you're at work that you're at risk it's when you're driving home from work or to work or to ball practice or out to your favorite hunting spot or you know to um the movies, whatever it is, you're just as risk there as you are as at work. So you getting them to tie in that the safety isn't something they just shut off when they clock out. It's something that we wanted to take at home. <clears throat> and another visual, and, and the visuals gets their brains going. And, and the term that we use at DECRA is SIF, severe incident fatal potential. So as we look at the history of the last 30 years that we've seen the OSHA recordable rate reduce, but our fatals, as you see, have not significantly at the same measures that the uh, recordables have. This gives the visuals of to the frontline persons, we're trying to protect you from those things that are going to keep you from your loved ones or alter your life forever. And it's getting them to have that hyper focus on the same things they do every single day. Hey, we've always stepped over this. Um, uh, extension cord. We've always stepped over this conveyor. Just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean we can't look at doing it a better way. And getting this visual here to tie it back that our severe, most severe incidents and fatal potentials, that's what we need to begin to be laser focused on. And just using more data to, to, to your advantage. You know, I show that our OSHA rate in private industry uh, for fatalities have increased year over year. And that they can see that 5,190 families in 2017 experienced this. So tying it back to them, you know, why is this important to them? Why do they need to pay attention? So this is still in that why portion of your training. Give them the data, show them the why. 
you know, do a little Southern Baptist preacher at them, you know, a little fire brimstone and let them have it and show it this is what happened. But then come back with the good cop, bad cop technique. Give them, give them the love and care they need by showing the, the, the data like Liberty Mutual's put together and other insurance providers out there that when the errors are made, it's not just from the training and knowledge discrepancy or the equipment breakdown, you know, the human performance side, which has become such an integral part of our organizational uh, development is focusing on maximizing performance. And this is the data that helps support it. More visuals here is, you know, the iceberg. You've all seen different versions of the iceberg. This is one that I like to use. Um, you know, it's a little older, some would say outdated, but uh, it's a good visual. The, the incidents and injuries are those things that we see and the things underneath, um, the, the importance of reporting the near misses, the minor injuries, you know, doing the, the behavior-based safety observations, the at-risk unsafe behavior coaching, and then ultimately um, auditing your systems to identify those poorly designed areas that could be improved. One other uh, that, that I like to do is videos. So uh, at this point in time, if we were doing a, a coaching training or even an OSHA 10 hour, I would plug in um, this video here um, that displays a person getting out of their vehicle to pump gas. And in this, we're teaching those incident investigation uh, techniques, trying to go beyond the blame of the person. So in this video, the person pumps the gas and then gets taken out by tandem tires off of a semi-trailer um it's it's in this that we want to we will tell them throughout the training you know incident investigation uh that we want to go beyond the blame of the person but let them go through it themselves teach them by doing say watch this video work together in pairs and partners and find the direct cause get into the root cause what could be done to have prevented this from occurring and, and taking them through the steps of your company and, and teaching through the power of videos. This isn't the only one out there. There are several. Find the one that works for you. Um, but what I like about this one is you can say, hey, this is a person that is flying and traveling for the company when we could do that. Um, they have a rental car. They're filling it up before they go to the airport. So this person's fully on the clock. And they get wiped out by tandem tires, break their leg. You know, now we've got ourselves a record, an OSHA recordable incident. And when we want to try to lead them down the path of, well, how is this preventable? And what happens uh, in those conversations, people will talk about the gas pumper. You know, he needs to position himself to where you can see. He should have his head on a swivel. He should be paying attention all the time. And then they start to go into, well, how do we prevent the tandem tires from taking them out in the first place? That's when that mental switch is coming with your group and that's this is kind of a good barometer check i like to put this in halfway through the training to kind of see where they're at and uh so this is a, a good one that i like to use um <clears throat> the, the other one with the, the clicker technology is uh if i'm getting into a topic um where there might be uh people that have more experience or qualifications on the topic than i do I'll gauge the room. Do we have any first responders in the room? And if if we do uh, have any uh, first responders when we're getting into bloodborne pathogen or emergency action planning and response, you know, I'll encourage them to participate. Hey, from your experience, do you have anything to share? Um, it gets another voice in the group. It engages and shows that you're going beyond the preaching into the teaching. Um, so I really like to, to use that when it's necessary and using your experts. Um, one of the things I like to do when teaching the 10 and 30 hour is if the organization wants, um, they have a lot of drivers and they want us to focus on distract and defensive driving, we'll bring in a uh, DOT vehicle enforcement officer or a, um, a sheriff's deputy or a state trooper, whoever's available to come in and speak. You know, if it's more of an office staff and their ergonomic focus, maybe we'll reach out to the local hospital or a physical therapist or an ergonomic uh, individual to come in and just give um, an hour intro for them. Um, so don't be afraid to use the experts that you have um, 
you know, if you reach out to your local uh, enforcement, uh, police department, sheriff, and saying, hey, we'd like you to come in and speak to our group on uh, safe driving, those folks love that stuff. Um, they're, they're regular individuals like the rest of us. They would much rather be in a classroom teaching your group than out there pulling people over. Um, I haven't met a group of individuals that would rather be teaching in there than out enforcing. Um, they want to be on the preventative side just as we are. So use those resources, network, your, your insurance providers, law enforcement. Um, I've even seen a few organizations that will share safety directors. They'll swap safety directors for trainings. You know, maybe there's one person that has more of an environmental background for an organization than another one across the uh, town or street uh, he'll have or she will have more of a background with industrial hygiene. And, you know, those organizations work it out. Hey, well, let's flip them for the day. Let's use our resources that are around us. So uh, using your, your local ASSP chapters and your local safety groups that you're in and networking that you have, uh, resource borrow. Um, and if you need to do a little bit of it from each other. Um, so those are some tips along the way that can be helpful. Uh, another one that we like to do is we'll do a fastest response question. So we'll put up a slide like this and, uh, and it's amazing. You got all those people that have been disengaging and it's been three or four uh, minutes since their last uh, video slide. And then we'll say, all right, the winner of this question gets a koozie or you know, a Snickers bar or whatever it is. And those people are scrambling for it. And then you throw the question up and you ask, you know, uh, here's a, a, a grain and processing society question. When was it started? And boom. 1930, they instantly get the answer for the question. <clears throat> then we're able to display the winner. Now this is using the, uh, the actual clicker devices. If they're using their cell phones, their name would show up. So there's some different ways um, that you can get creative. Now in the current climate that we're in, doing as much through remote, whether it's Zoom, there also are those capabilities as well that a person can answer from their computer. So a lot of different ways of the technology that's currently available that you can adjust and mimic it to how you need to. But it goes back to engaging those folks, uh, that they're retaining uh, the content you're trying to deliver and that they're getting something out of your training class. So that's one that we'd like to use. And I'll plug these in. If I do an OSHA 10 hour class, we'll do probably 15, of these questions throughout the uh, 10 hours of delivery and uh, just giving away little little items. Sometimes we even give away uh, first aid kits and those such things. And um, they, they really get engaged. They really have some fun with it and they get pretty competitive, uh, the participants in your class. So those are some tips along the way that could be helpful. Um, these questions here show some uh, regulatory questions that help build for your team score at the end. So just showing and showing that retention. Now, if I were instructing right now and I only had 47% of my class that got the answer right, and I know I've already covered this content, this is an opportunity for me to go, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe as a trainer and educator, I didn't get my point across, okay? Uh, I need to readdress this. So this is the opportunity to go to the class and say, all right, hey, we covered confined space and the minimum oxygen level needed and obviously i didn't do a good job explaining it well, let's cover this again so that is a nice benefit of using this type of technology um to, to help with that engagement and that instant correction um so just some more questions showing and, and some different ways to keep them engaged you know what standards for uh the osha construction portion 1926 uh just building out for that team score at the end <clears throat> and about halfway through which is what we are we're right at uh 1229 iowa time which is central time we're about halfway through and people have a phone itch uh some of you have already done it uh you checked your phone you're looking at your email you're kind of paying attention that way you can show your boss that you you did this virtual training and uh, you're kind of engaged here. Uh, at this point in time, I like to use 
what's free out there? Well, OSHA has an app. So if I'm teaching a 10 or a 30 hour, I'll have all the people that are willing. Most of them have their personal phones. And I'll say, hey, I understand they're your personal phones. But if you want to, there's a free resource to you. And instead of logging around that old OSHA 1910 manual, that's four inches thick, um, there's one that you can download for free. And uh, this is what it looks like. Go to your Google store or whatever it is that you use. Um, and uh, th this is a great where they already have that itch. They want the phone. I'll encourage them, get your phone out. And another thing that I'll do is if I'm able to get most of, or if not all of the class, which I did a 10 hour before all this COVID hit uh, in Montana, um, we were doing a 10 hour in person. And that's everybody in the class was able to download it. I said, okay, hey, I got a $10 gas card here to the gas station in town. Um, I, for the person who can find the answer first, I'm looking for uh, what standard and the, the 1910 grain standard 272 references housekeeping. Go and make it a race. So they've, they've wanted their phone in their hands. And we're always, as, as educators and trainers, all oh, phones are bad, no phones. Well, they want them in their hands anyways. Use it to your advantage. Use it as a teaching technique. So this is something that I have recently used myself. Now, were some of the people faking it and checking Facebook instead? Probably. Maybe. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, that room was pretty competitive at that moment to, to find the answer to the 1910 question that I asked. So... That's another tip for you. Um, it's a free download. Um, there's some different apps that are available too. And uh, going over those, um, you know, when we teach risk identification, <clears throat> I like to use uh, pictures to do so. So these are just some different ones that maybe you've seen. Um, you know, I try to stay away from using pictures of people they may know. Uh, so when we get to those types of pictures that are internal use, like this one here with the skid loader, I use it in a way where we're not going to put the company logo on there, the person that made the uh, the, the judgment um, is, is not displayed. Now, I personally enjoy this picture because this is in uh, where I grew up in Iowa, and the operator uh, is one of my younger brothers. I have five brothers. So the uh, the location manager I hunt with, and he uh, sent this picture to me. Hey, look what your brother did. And I was like, this is awesome. Now, my brother called me a few minutes afterwards, and he's like, Joe, please don't put that in your PowerPoints. And it's like, dude, you're going to be world famous here. You shouldn't have been driving that way. So, uh, But using those where we're not embarrassing the people, and I know I just embarrassed my own brother, but I didn't say the name or the company. Um, but using internal pictures in a way that they're teaching tools and not embarrassment techniques. Um, so some different ones here, you see one from an inspection that a person did, you know, the importance of not blocking our electrical panels, uh, keeping the uh, trash can lids out from in front so we can access. Um, and another one in a lot, a lot of portions of the country, this is gonna become important uh, throughout the, the spring uh, animals are going to start moving. So as they're, whether the people are driving for your company or not, whether they're driving to and from work, we want to be aware of those those animals. Now this is in uh, outside of Calgary um, when I was up there with my wife for our honeymoon, and that is a couple of elk. Okay, so just using the pictures that you have, you can go to Google, uh, you can use your own, uh, borrow from others as well. So some different different ways. Um, and, you know, some I'm seeing on how do we use these for games. Using your pictures as, hey, what's wrong with this picture right now? Okay. So let them identify it. You know, put them in teams. Say, hey, do a risk assessment of this picture right now. And give them 30, 45 seconds to work on whatever it is. Um, so that's a different way to look at using pictures as some fun games, interactive um, and this is just another example of a video that I use. Uh, this is one that maybe you've seen before. The guy gets frustrated. And it's an older one because obviously those style of computers, uh, I don't think we've used in 10 or 12 years, or whatever it is. So it's a little older one, but the video shows the guy is super frustrated and takes his keyboard and starts bashing his computer in. Uh, what I liked about this video 
is that the person in the cubicle next to him, you see the top of his head, uh, he peeks over and looks, because the guy is obviously making a lot of noise. He looks over and sees who, what's going on and then immediately ducks back down into his seat. I like to use this in behavior-based safety training from approachability standpoint is, hey, when real bad things happen, think about yourself. Would you want to approach you to give you feedback? If the answer is not sure or no, then nobody else around you is going to. So help yourself, protect yourself from yourself, and allow your coworkers to give you feedback or approach you by making yourself more approachable, by not ripping their head off or jumping down their throat, by not putting up a false barrier and those such things that we're, we're able to work through and solving problems together. So that's kind of how I use this video that most of you have probably seen before. Um, you can just simply Google it. Um, Guy beats computer screen in with a keyboard on the old YouTube or Google device and that'll get you there. So some of you have asked for work, specific workshops and games and videos. Um, so I, I see some of them are coming in. I know they're gonna answer questions at the end, but uh, for some of you that are asking now, how do we do it? Uh, what, I'll, what I like to do in any class, whether it's a, a, a coaching, an observer, a 10 hour, a 30, whatever it is, leadership, we'll break them into small groups. And this is more towards the end when we get into practicing um, the what and the how, is we'll break them into some small groups, we'll put a video up, and we just have them kind of go through what happened, why did it happen, and what actions, corrective actions need to be put into place. So one of them that I enjoy is the uh, million dollar forklift accident. I'm pretty sure all of you safety professionals that are on have seen this or used it um, in your um, careers. But uh, I like to use this one from a standpoint of, this is obviously a cluttered warehouse. Uh, this forklift driver, many times our immediate eyes go, we gotta blame the driver. You know, gotta blame the, the forklift operator. And uh, as the video goes on, they hit the, the, the pallet rack and the whole pallet um, racks come down. The person obviously doesn't have their seatbelt on. They jump out of the, the seat and they run straight for the parking lot into the truck and they take off. And it's a good 12 to 15 seconds before anybody in the facility responds to the floor. So what we're really trying to teach here is let's go beyond the blame of the person. What would we like to be done different? And how do we do it in a manner that's not blaming the operator? And, you know, there are some operational errors made by the person, but uh, it's systemic from the environment. So it's just driving them deeper into understanding how do we get better and different results by being critical of our environment without just finger pointing? And this video here really does a good job of teaching those tools of what happened, why did it happen, and what can be done different. Um, so this is just one way to use the videos um, that we've had success with. But uh, a, a reminder when using videos and pictures, be mindful of copyright. You don't want to put yourself or your company in a position where you're uh, using material that have copyright protection. Get those permissions from the insurance providers and your uh, web providers, whoever it is, content providers, to reuse that information if you have permission. Um, Homemade videos uh, sometimes can be the best ones, but keep those internal. I'm pretty sure your HR and legal uh, uh, counsel would advise you to as well um, to keep those for internal uses uh, from a liability standpoint. But for simple, you know, you've seen it, I used some pictures and I pulled some of them straight from Manshed. It's right on uh, Facebook. Uh, Fail Army is another one. Some of my my material just comes straight from following these types of pages on uh, Facebook. And, but know when to be fun and not vulgar. Uh, the worst thing you could do in a training is unintentionally uh, cover a topic or tell a story or show a picture and cross a line. And now you've shut a portion of your class off to what you're trying to cover. Um, so have fun, enjoy, use those pictures and stories but be cognitive to not go over the top or vulgar. And if you're not sure of a video or a picture or a story, then you probably shouldn't show it or tell it. 
Um, because the end goal is to empower and educate employees on how to properly identify and manage risk. If your story or picture is going to put that in um, limbo, then probably need to remove that. So just some different examples here. These are the, the three different ones that I follow on Facebook. If you follow Facebook, um, you know, you find some good uh, material. Um, well, let's redefine what good means here. Some useful material and teaching techniques of what not to do. Um, so it, it keeps it in a manner where you can have some fun with it, but you're not showing the gruesome pictures of the the, the hand severed off or the arc flash scars and those things. So sometimes you can turn a stomach of an individual unintentionally. <clears throat> Some other techniques that we try to try to teach pretty thoroughly um, within DECRA, but also within when I do any classes is the different coaching techniques. Now, obviously here you have the former Nebraska uh, football coach, Bo Pelini, that was his normal face, it seemed like, when he coached. And then on the left, obviously, is our uh, our uh, legendary Dr. Tom Davis, uh, men's basketball coach of Iowa. And next to him is the late Chris Street. Um, this picture was taken a few games before Chris Street passed away in a uh, car accident. And what's important here when you're teaching the techniques is in the face of tragedy, in the face of controversy, like we are facing now with COVID, our character is exposed. What type of coach are we going to be? You know, right now, a lot of us are stretched thin. Some of you are being forced to work from home, maybe with your, your children and spouses around. You're spending more time with those people in, in your house than you ever have or you, in the, the recent past. Uh, a lot of things are getting mixed up. Just remind yourself in this moment, Ah, chaos is when character is exposed. What type of character and teaching techniques do I want to be? What kind of coach do I want to be of my team and my coworkers and my team members? Do I want to be a Bo Pelini or do I want to be a Dr. Tom? Okay. And not just bashing Bo Pelini here. Um, for many years, his players loved him and spoke out for him. But you understand what we're saying there, that Bobby Knight style of my way or the highway. What type of coach are we going to be? Because what we know, people are going to work harder for a motivator than they are a punisher. So in these moments, what's going to keep those folks engaged and and, and not uh, be susceptible to the many distractions that are out there right now is those leaders, that appreciative style feedback, that Tony Dungy style, that teacher, that calm, that collective, that steady hand. Remember to be that person. Uh, be the best version of this person as you can in these moments and avoid trying to be this guy. A lot of success he had, but he also, when we talk about the career of what is Coach Knight, the championships sometimes aren't the first things mentioned. It's the throwing of the chair. It's the um, physically harming some of his players. It's chasing away a player like Larry Bird. So in these moments, don't chase your Larry Birds away. Keep them engaged through these techniques that we've uh, covered. Um, another teaching technique, uh, to borrow one here from uh, Dr. Aubrey Daniels, they use it in their teaching is the picnic drill. So if you haven't seen this before, I encourage you to, uh, to resource to, to YouTube. Um, uh, Hoyt and several others that work with um, Aubrey Daniels can walk you through. But this is just a simple uh, visual of how to teach. Why do we do what we do? Why do we end up speeding? You know, yes, we know a ticket and an accident is negative, but man, fun and faster. That's that positive, immediate, certain outcome. So when you're trying to get a training topic and grind, throw the picnic drill in there. Walk them through. Why do we need to do it this way? Why do we need to follow lockout tag out? Why do we need to do uh our incident investigations this way and take it back to the picnic draw okay so just another resource that's available to you um that i use that's enjoyable um and uh teamwork towards safety you know so some coin uh phrases i've used you know find the coaching opportunity discipline when life safety rules have been violated um catch people doing things right you know in this current climate that we're in with COVID, there's a lot of stress on individuals. 
Go back to the foundation of what makes your organization great. Coach your coworkers up. Hey, go out and find someone doing something right. Go take two minutes, and I want you to go out on the floor and find someone doing something good. I don't care what it is. Quality, safety, communication, whatever it is. Keep your six-foot distance. Follow all the CDC guidelines, okay? But find someone doing something good. Um, that is what's going to keep the morale together uh, as we go through this climate that we're in. And we don't know how long this is going to last. But here's some tips. Doing safety with them, not at them. Doing the good catches is what's going to keep you uh, driving forward through this time and not just survive it, but thrive. Uh, so this shows the team score. This is the point where Kansas State uh, won this portion, and uh, they would have got gas cards or whatever it is we're handing out. So that's just a visual of how we tie that back. So some other games. I see some questions here from a few other people, um, some other games that uh, that we do, uh, that I've done before is uh, the paper airplane game. So to take a minute and explain this one, I'll hand out blank pieces of paper. I do, I do like the clicker questions, but there are times where I've done classes in a multi-lingual um, setting through uh, different translators. And I think I've driven home all the points this is where I'll bring in the paper airplane game. I'll have them write down their question on the piece of paper, make an airplane. Everybody in the class will do it, and they'll throw the airplane in the air. And I'll, when they all settle, I'll tell everyone, pick up an airplane that's not yours. Open it up and uh, read the question. And I'll go around the room and uh, have people read the questions out. No one writes their name on it. Um, I've seen this be extremely successful in all things, not just the multilingual settings. But you may have thought you covered a point, and you may very well have, but that person spaced off at that moment, and they didn't get that information. Hey, where do we go for a tornado? I've seen that pop up. Even though we covered it five times in the last hour, somebody spaced off and didn't get that info. And you're able to write it down without somebody, you know, raising, doing the old raise the hand. Because at the end of the class, everyone will do, hey, does anyone have any questions? And everyone looks around, and they, they look at it their coworkers and they're like, you better not ask a question. We got lunchtime here. We gotta get out of here. And doing the paper airplane game can get that final question that might be super critical. Um, so I've seen that one uh, be really successful. I've used it uh, several times and I like it. A uh, flashcard game. If you have procedural steps, uh, so sometimes within pro uh, PSM, process safety management, there's certain steps that you need them to know, uh, maybe even within lockout, tagout, uh, putting those procedures uh, on flashcards, breaking them into teams, and, and have them work on getting those proper steps in place. Um, that can be a cheap and easy way um, to get them to practice hands-on without necessarily getting out on the floor. Um, and another one for uh, coaching uh, is penny talk. And as you see there, uh, we'll uh, get three volunteers or voluntold. Usually I try to get a boss person. Um, we kind of have fun with those people, but uh, we'll take the three people out of the room. We'll keep the rest of the class in there. And we'll bring them in one at a time. We're gonna blindfold them, give them 10 pennies and have them toss the pennies into the basket. Typically I'll put uh, a little garbage basket or waste basket or a clothes basket about 10 feet in front of them. They're blindfolded and they toss 10 pennies in there. The first person that goes, uh, we give no feedback, okay? So this is, goes to the old adage, hey, head down, no one says anything, you're good. And it's amazing, one of two things happen. Either the person throwing the pennies just continually hits in the same spot, whether it's in the basket or not, they don't deviate whatsoever. Um, and they'll typically about halfway through ask for feedback because they know it's a feedback drill. Or they'll start guessing. They'll start going all over the place, trying to listen to hitting the basket or hitting something. And, uh, and that's where we can say guessing's not good enough for your customers. And in guessing in, in any type of culture, whether it's safety, production, quality, customer service, that's not what we're trying to get out of it. Then the second person, this is usually where we put a boss, um, a supervisor is, this is where we'll give them the negative feedback. And typically what we see is the person 
will start throwing pennies about the fifth or sixth penny. They'll give up, and, they quit, and then the last person is the coaching positive feedback. And obviously that person, typically, um, we uh, see an improvement there. And uh, it's a good way to drive that home. So those are some other inexpensive games. And we're getting into our final 10 minutes here, and we have some questions coming in. So we want to be able to get to those. So just a quick recap. Um, every three to five slides, re-engage those attendees using the pictures, the videos, the workshops, the clicker questions. Um, use uh, multiple exercises, the hands-on approach, doing the, the workshops, uh, and really go back to being a teacher, working with them. And uh, every 55 minutes, the human brain needs a break. Uh, I've gone to classes uh, for my uh, OSHA 501, and you'll get an instructor that comes in, and they'll, they'll say, well, my style is to take a break every two hours. Holy shnikes, that is a long two hours. People need a break. They're not used to sitting in that chair. And if you don't give them one, they're going to take one right in that chair. So every 55 minutes, let them get up, go to the bathroom, um, check their phone, do whatever they're going to do. They're checking out on you anyways. So bring in subject matter experts when they're when they're available and it makes sense. And, uh, you know, be relatable and ultimately find your own style. I'm a high energy guy and that works for me. That may not be the best for you. Um, so find your own style. And uh, from there, this is my contact info. Uh, if uh, you ever have any questions, reach out to me directly. I know uh, uh, Barry's going to get on here and tell you how to access the, the materials. And I think we want to go ahead and start answering some questions. So, um, Barry, if you'd like to jump on here and uh, direct us towards the questions, and we'll try to get those answered for him. Great. Thank you, Joe. We appreciate your insights today. And as you can probably imagine, Joe, we've heard from some Iowa Hawkeye fans and some folks who are not Iowa Hawkeye fans today. So um, remember, folks, if you do have a question, we're going to let Joe take a break, grab a drink of water here. If you do have a question, go ahead and type it in the text box, and that's in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and click on the button for Submit Question. I also want to remind everyone today of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. Uh, that survey should be appearing on your screen right now. And your feedback is extremely important to us. It definitely helps us to improve our future webcasts. If you don't see the survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker, and you may also access the evaluation by clicking the survey button near the lower right portion of your screen. And in addition, uh, folks from Returning Technologies and DECRA today have uh, made the, all the slides available. It is on the resources widget on your screen. And now let's go ahead and get to some questions. Joe, I want to start with uh, a, a really interesting question, a lot, of, a lot of technology questions, as I'm sure you can imagine. And uh, one of our attendees asks, does this technology work for remote trainings? Obviously, we're in a time when everybody's looking for remote uh, resources. Uh, does this technology work for remote trainings? And, and I think by answering this, we're going to be able to answer a lot of the questions that are up here that I see from Morgan and Christy and a few others is, yes, there are remote capabilities. So when you set up uh, using uh, turning technology, uh, if that's who you choose, that's who I use, so I'm an end user of their product. Uh, what I like about it is that in PowerPoint, it has its own tab called Turning. So when I want to add a question, as you saw, I just simply go to that tab and I add the question. And then from there, when it goes to the delivery side, the person can have a physical device in their hand, they can use their phone, and if you're using remote, they can answer through their computer. Okay, so the remote options are available for them to answer uh, and their computer, and there's even some remote um, phone capabilities as well as more Zoom trainings and those things are coming up. So to answer specifically, Morgan, um, the fastest response question platform, that is a component inside Turning Technology uh, that I use, and it's, as you saw, a very valuable tool. So I think, Barry, we might have got a few of them answered there. You definitely killed a couple birds with one stone there, Joe. Um, I wanted to, to reach out here. There's a question from Brian in our audience today. And, and Brian's looking for a program to pull trainees during a training session. Are there programs or apps that you would recommend? 
I, I've used a few others at other conferences. So, you know, we'll go to a conference and they'll be uh, highlighting uh, another product. Um, and I've used them, uh, you know, I guess for me and, and my company, I, you know, we don't have a direct um, license agreement uh, to, to push or promote turning technology. I know they're the ones that are promoting today's. Um, the other ones out there, I've used them. But for, for my company, we um, subscribe to Turning Technology. They're the ones we've had the most success with. And what I mean by success is the, the people side of it. Um, you know, I work with Chrissy in their office, and she's great. I tell her boss all the time, if you get rid of Chrissy or Chrissy retires, I may have to consider another product. Because to me, the people side of it is what ties it back. Um, but there are other ones out there. Um, but, you know, without going to the Google, I, I just haven't looked, Brian. I, I'm not sorry as far as other programs and apps out there uh, for uh, pulling the trainees. I just use turning technology. So I guess I'm staying company line on this one. Um, Great, well, thank you, Joe. We, we do have another question um, regarding phone usage. Uh, somebody mentions, can, can participants use their phones or computers to answer uh, turning point questions during training? Yeah, so if you're doing a live audience, if you ever get back to that after this COVID, you're able to do a live audience, you can do a handheld uh, clicker where you hand those out. Um, and those can sometimes be a little, that's your upfront cost. Uh, what I like about doing it that way is some classes, not everybody has a smartphone. And then you get into the smartphone might be their personal phone. And depending on that workplace culture, they may or may not be willing to use their phone. But if they are willing, I like the phone because it's you can do the live polling as the answers come in. They can see the bar graphs move up and down. It's a lot of fun. Um, and the remote right now, you can do it through your computer, and that can be live as well or fixed uh, results. What I mean by fixed results is that you ask the question, you see your answers come in, and then when you have all the respondents have answered, then you hit close, then it will show them results. Uh, at the end rather than alive. So it's just what your preference is that has all the capabilities. Okay, great, thank you, Joe. Um, we do have another question regarding phone usage. Mm -hmm. I think we may have touched on this one already. Uh, Chris okay. asks, um, what, what apps do you recommend for phone usage, uh, specifically to display responses on the screen during a presentation? Yeah, I just go back to um, if you're trying to get it displayed on the screen through the turning technology um, uh, PowerPoint, uh, they can either download the turning technology app or you can give them a web link on the uh, slide that they can access through their uh, Safari or whatever internet mode they have on their mobile device. Um, and as far as other apps that are available that, that we can use, uh, I, I referenced the OSHA app early on, and then for truck drivers, we will get into the uh, state-specific DOT weather apps. So um, as far as other phone apps, there's a few others that we've used. Okay, great. Well, Joe, we really appreciate your time today. Um, that's all the time we have for questions today, so we want to thank everyone for joining us. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all of our questions today, uh, unanswered questions, will be forwarded along to Joe and the folks at Turning Technologies. Uh, once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to share your input with us. And behind, on behalf of everyone here at the National Safety Council, uh, we hope you're all safe and healthy out there during this time. That ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank our outstanding presenter today, Joe Melton of Becra. Everyone from our sponsor, Turning Technologies, and all of you who listened in today. Thank you and have a safe day.